Um, thank you everyone who's stuck with us for two days of planning about um, data and software preservation. We appreciate your input to the ProsQT grant process and to gathering information from all our stakeholders. Um, we're going to assemble a final wrap-up panel. So we have Steve Andrelakis from Nectar. Um, we have uh, Margaret Berta. She's an undergraduate student here at University of Notre Dame. She's representing learners and those um, early career researchers. We have Sherry Lake. She is an experienced data curator and a digital librarian. And we have Helen Hawksju. She is researching preservation here at University of Notre Dame and um, has a lot of experience with web archiving. And we hope that this variety of perspectives will help us um, look at what um, PresQT can work on next and what tools might be, might be most useful to our communities. So our first question is going to be how to identify PresQT priorities. And we're going to give you a preview of some of the feedback from the survey about tool usefulness. Um, one of the things I was curious about is who should the tool gaps prioritized by PresQT serve? Those who often share or those who seldom share? So this is your warm up giveaway question. And um, I'm going to hit Sherry with it first because she's been a data curator for a long time. Um, when you think about improving your system, um, do you think about improving it for um, people who aren't frequent users now or for your frequent users? In other words, should PressQT help people who are seldom sharing or those who are already sharing? Why or why not? Or how do we balance those needs? I think you're targeting those who are already sharing because that way that eliminates one barrier because those who aren't already sharing, you have to work on them to share in the first place. So at least the ones that are sharing, they have a goal or they want to share. So I think, you know, they'll be an easier sell or something like this. Or perhaps they could learn by example from those yeah. who are sharing. Um, would you like to comment on that, Steve? Yeah, I'd be more, well. <laughs> or you can wait if you don't like that. No, I'm going to answer. Lots of questions. <laughs> I just, well, you know, just jumping around. Um, I'm actually very interested in, uh, still in why people don't. Mm -hmm. actually and so even if you know you guys go ahead and and serve the the one the, the excited ones who are happy with sharing um i think we can't forget about the ones who are more reluctant or maybe want to or have tried and then failed for some reason because or decided it was too hard like encoded in this question are a lot of follow-up questions that i would have and i think that should be the basis of a future investigation within this as well. Oh, that's wonderful. Thanks. How about you, Margaret? Um, I think the focus should be on those who seldom share, um, mostly because at least as a student, I had never really heard about the idea of like data preservation. And so I think as it becomes more of a mainstream idea and it's more incorporated into you know, the classroom and just general ideas of science research um, that you can really just make general improvements once, once you have more people on board with that. Wonderful. Thanks. Helen? I'm afraid I won't be able to give you a binary answer. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> so I'm thinking about um, essentially a few things. First of all, regardless if people are sharing or not sharing, from a tool development perspective, are there any immediate or low-hanging fruit we can benefit from? Secondly, think about the 20 and 2080 rule. Other things we can do with, with less effort, but have where well, you know which we can maximize the impact. And then coming back to those who share and don't share, I think for those who already share, I would like to know are there things you can't do because you you want to share, you have that intention, but you practically can't do it because you know you lack the tools. For those who don't share, I probably I, I doubt, even if given the tools that would solve the problem, I would like to understand the psychology or the barriers behind not sharing. So, or even ask, ask the question, what does it take, you know, for you to share? So that's <laughs> good question. Very good, thank you. 
Um, moving along, one question um, that we asked on our survey was related to ease of keywording. And I was surprised to see the respondents within our own group finding that it was only moderately easy uh, to keyword their own work um, or to use keywording within the systems on which they did sharing. So one of my questions for the panel is, is there a gap related to ease of tagging and keyword assignment or implementation of search expansion that PressQT could fill? Go for it, Sharon. Actually, well, I, um, this is actually going back to the demo we just had with the ocean, um, code ocean. I was actually looking at some of those um, algorithms and they were tagged, but they seem to be tagged along the algorithm, like what methodology was used, what type of data it was used. They weren't necessarily using the research terms of what I might want to search for and if I'm studying heart murmurs or if I'm doing um, brain imaging. Those type of keywords didn't seem to be in that algorithm thing. So, so to me, the difference between keywords of what algorithm I use versus keywords of what I'm studying. That's what I Notice. That's a good um, observation. Anyone else want to tackle that one or shall we move on? Just a quick comment in that I often find it quite difficult to assign keywords for whatever I'm putting out there without any guidance of the level of granularity, if you like. And what I would like, I, I personally I find it helpful if I'm prompted with some sort of authoritative vocabulary or schema. And on top of that, so, because that gives you actually a boundary already. On top of that, I can add my free style tagging. So that would be my preferred mm -hmm. uh, way if a system helps me. So, so I'd be more willing and find it easier to, to tag things. Yeah. Excellent, thanks. Our next question is related to usefulness. So would you be interested in tools that help better show who did what when, or who changed what when, or do you think that's a solved problem? It's definitely not a solved problem. It's a, provenance is still a research question, actually. Um, and I think everyone, every system and environment should do work to, to collect provenance information. Um, I also think that the main problem you'll see is that, okay, so consider something like Galaxy, People are familiar with Galaxy. Um, great if you stay in that ecosystem and you're, you know, running tools and you're chaining them and doing everything. Yeah, it'll it'll save a level of provenance for you, and you can backtrack. But the moment you break out of that for any reason, there goes your provenance. There's we're still not even in, you know, we still haven't even gotten used to moving data around in a in a kind of standardized way or using tools in a standardized way. You kind of need all of that to exist before doing or having a view of provenance that's total in the scientific or research workflow. I agree. Just to comment on, I think this on the word provenance, because that's definitely a library term or, um, because to me provenance is more of who type stuff, who, um, who did stuff with it. But for reproducibility, um, what is important? Like what was done to it in order to backtrack and you need to go back or whatever. Uh, and a lot of people might not consider that. Yeah. <coughs> That's a good observation. Yeah. Go ahead, Nancy. Robin, I, I learned from going from the library that that actually is not a return only. One of the things that Lisa has done recently in the last couple of years is to come up with uh, uh, something, uh, kind of a standard that you're taking to I, uh, W3C for a, a context or provenance related to certain kinds of NASA data, mission data. Uh, it's probably called the CS product context context standard. It's something to look at. Part, part, partly because it's a specific to a certain domain, categories that were used as part of that, including like the informative, it could do some other things as well. Next question. Um, how useful are tools that let you preserve your own or reuse others' workflows? And is that a tool you would find uh, useful in your own work? I'm going to start with Margaret. Um, I think that that would definitely be useful too, especially when you're working on these large group projects. But kind of going back to the last question, um, I think one of the main
major reasons, at least in like the hard sciences, the chemistry in particular, the reason why a lot of people aren't forthcoming about their data is because it is such a competitive field. And so, you know, if there was a way to have a very accurate record of what was done and when, I think people would be much more willing to post their preliminary results and data online and wouldn't be so, um, with, like, keep those results. Anyone else like to ask a question? I yeah. actually want to go back to the last question about, about front openness. Uh, I just want to say how, in my line of work, you know, archiving and preservation, how important and crucial that is, especially um, to the interpretation and understanding of historical data. So recently I was looking at some um, data from a 1967 social research. I had to go back and look at, go through the notes, but there was one person, you know, who played a role in the chain of custodianship of that data set. It took a long time to understand what his role was, you know, what kind of custodian or provenance co role this person played and how that actually misled us at, at times. You know, in the end, it was all out, but I thought without that information or clear, you know, if it wasn't that information or if the information was clearer, how much more effective we could have been or not have been. <laughs> good, good observation, good catch. Um, how about fixity? So we heard Jeff's talk yesterday about hashing and ways we could use hashing to discover and identify data we're interested in. But um, one of the other ways that we can use hashing and we can use checksums is to help us establish points of fixity and comparison related to data. Um, when we look at tools that help users or data curators identify whether a digital file is fixed or unchanged, <coughs> how important are tools like that to you in your everyday work or in the users you serve? Sure. In, in my line, of, I mean, it's, it's important, I think, on the preservation end to make sure that what was put in our repository, someone is getting out, is the same thing. But I really don't think researchers think about that. You know? or, I mean, I, I know I remember early on teaching data management, talking about um, one way of checking your data, um, the word cache or the word checksum, they had no clue what that meant or why they even needed to do that. Fair enough. Anyone else want to comment on that, John? No, so I have a question, uh, maybe going one question back about uh, how having user reserve their own research. Does the panel see any challenges for the user to kind of taking care of their own archives? So if a user is responsible for preserving their own workflow, is that a burden that's fair to place on the user? Has utility for the user or <laughs> what are the challenges if it um, yeah. Yeah. Um, because we've done tech research, this should have to care about this. It should be automated entirely. Whatever tools are using should have to build them to it. It's so straightforward. Well, sorry, to check someone. Preserving or using our own workflows, actually, they should be the same as well. And I've seen a couple of tools that have tried to automate um, capturing information about workflows in a way that is really important to That currently, the level of computing knowledge you need to do all of that is too high. Like it presumes a level of computer expertise that the average, your average scientist in the biosciences doesn't have from what I, who I've met anyway. Um, that's actually not really their problem or their fault or shouldn't be their problem. The tooling should accommodate them, particularly in hashes, which is something that is kind of a solved problem. And I don't think it's overly complicated as a, as a workflow. Um, we should solve that problem. Like Open Science Framework has it embedded, it's quite clear, you know, maybe it could even be clearer, just you know, rather than using hash language and having long, <laughs> that scares people a lot, just say this is unchanged or, you know, these match. <laughs> there, there are small ways to make your, of these people's life, like illuminate the path, right? right. Yeah, indeed. Yeah, I just hope that, you know, when we talk about 60, we probably don't actually tell people in clearly enough about the scale and the probability. It doesn't necessarily have to happen. And when it happens, depending on the scale of the data, the impact may not be that bad. Just, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm just exaggerating the point into support. <laughs> you have to speak the language that people understand and what the researcher understands is different than someone who's reading about their research in USA Today understands. 
you have to target your audience so that you get what you want in the end. That's a fair observation too. Um, one of the things um, that we asked about yesterday was uh, the usefulness of tools that automate or nudge for better or easier tagging. Um, I wondered if any of the panelists or uh, participants would like to comment on um, whether you might find um, such a tool useful to your own work or within your own system. In the group we had assembled yesterday, um, that uh, received 36% uh, on uh, extremely useful, 23% on useful. That tips us over the 50% mark. Um, is that the kind of thing PressQT might focus on or look at? Or is, again, is that a solved problem or a specialty um, tool to develop? Any takers that help you in your selecting your metadata? Uh, I think I might be. I think it would be. And I also would be, if I choose a term, I actually would be interested to see other similar work, initiatives, uh, project, you, you, which use the same tag. Then, I, you know, that's a way of actually using your access. Do they have any tools? Um, definitely will outdate myself with silver platter. Um, in, the, in the medical field, um, when, when you actually would put a term in, it would suggest the medical term for it or give you a, a, the source. You go up and down the list and actually check off better terms um, to actually use. I think it would also be useful for people to have sort of a personal taxonomy, so it wouldn't change the official record at all. But it could be an overlay, so they would see all the official terms, and then they would have their own because everybody has their own terms in the, or the way they think of things, and that would help. And also, if you could look at that, if whoever owned that archive or whatever could look at it and say, you know, a lot of people are referring to this as this term. Let's add it in. Mm -hmm. So my question is, whose keyword lists will you use? How many such keywords that exist? Who already owns them and who has rights to modify them? All fair questions. And I think in the context of PresQT, uh, the onus is on us for the things we develop to be interoperable. So I would argue that any tools we build that help nudge or automate keywording have to interoperate with ISO standard taxonomies and have to interoperate with um, standard APIs that um, allow people to search keywords, but also um, to do search expansion against those taxonomies that we know are um, employed by some of the places where we store our work. Sean? Perhaps it's not automating and nudging for better and easier tagging, but being able to map between these tag sets. <laughs> You know, not do we have to run, re erase, and edit, become an editor for what somebody else used for tagging, or is it more important for us to be able to map those to the standard tagging that we know and they shouldn't be expected to know? But you know, tracking that mapping per submitter and per, per colloquial tag set might actually be a more useful thing than the one true tag that we must override all of the <laughs> tags with. That's yeah. right. Yeah, good observation. Steve, I think it's something like that. Yeah, it's just, I mean, I don't like keywords. In the age of Google, you know, that, I mean, I can see why people want to do it, but I just, I kind of reject it <laughs> outright. There's a reason why uh, modern things like Spotify, the music program, doesn't use genre tags. Uh, and Google Inbox, the, the, the newest app, you know, not the Gmail app, Google Inbox doesn't, has done away with tags. And, and the reason is I think we're getting to a point where through certain machine learning techniques, you can infer a lot about, you know, you can classify um, things fairly automatically. And that might be based on the content of it. It might be based on who looked at it and who it came from and the networks they operate in. And, and what people like Spotify are finding is, uh, are that doing away with genres, um, has actually allowed them to draw these cluster maps and, and find these clusters of stuff people like that they, there's not really a name for, but that's useful in and of itself. So I'd like to just do away with keywords. Um, I just want to ask whether keywords can only actually only exist because we manually add them. 
I, I think the answer is no, because recently I saw a demo of uh, the uh, Google Video API. How while you play a piece of video, a almost opaque you know, magic process takes place at the same time to identify based on image. I don't know how it works deep down, but it will extract out keyword and present it to the users. So that's one thing. So when we think about keywords, should we necessarily think that we manually add them? No, I think that's why this question for our audience was about tools that automate. So I know is a new is a keyword always human added? Probably not. Probably tools that automate keywording are so the future. And another another thing I want to share with the audience is that uh, about 15 years ago, I worked. I used. I worked at the UK uh, Joint Information Systems Committee. I did a heroic <laughs> project trying to map a number of um, history, like mesh, <laughs> against <laughs> judicial as the central spy. That project lasted at least five years. It was at the University of Clyde. I worked with Dr. Um, uh, Nicholas Johnson, I think. In the end, we really had to draw a line on this project. It was very, very hard in terms of the efforts and also, you know, I, anyways, I think don't know that's the answer. I think though it's important to, when talking about this, in light of what Steve said, to think about patents. Patents, when they're written, they never say, this is for X. <laughs> It always describes around that because you can't use the term that say exactly what the thing does that you're trying to patent. So sometimes it, it's very hard to search patents unless you're an expert because you can't say, I want this bottle because the patent will never say that you're designing a bottle. So if the Google thing works mm -hmm. and you get the patent for the bottle, even though it doesn't say bottle, great. <laughs> but if you don't, then that's a hole in that tool. But the problem I see with the automated tagging is that once you get into these really niche areas of research that yeah. you don't want automated tag, uh, tagging because you want something so specific. You know, there may be only 10 people in the world working on this and you don't want these somewhat connected areas so like that is just like a flip consideration right. yeah i agree with that and i've found that a lot in my own work when the kind of data or software you're curating is about non-textual content um, a lot of the things we're talking about are more difficult to achieve recently met some of the people working at New Age Factory on um, automatically tagging video using speech recognition. And that's an automated method of tagging, but there's speech under that video to recognize. When we look at a blast sequence, what are we tagging if we automatically tag? And how do we help the right users find that in the context that they need to complete? and share it with the right audiences. I don't know the answer, but I agree that's an issue. Um, finally, um, another one that we looked at was uh, the usefulness of profile-based recommenders. Um, is there inter any interest in PresQT or from the panelists in tools that help users identify digital resources of interest based on their profile? In other words, if you and I are friends, do we like the same music or not? And does that matter for people whose job it is to curate software and data or people who are trying to find software and data in our system? Any takers on that one? I would say that's slowing down on the priority list, not completely unuseful, but... Yeah, and we found that in our survey that 13% described it as extremely useful, 26% as useful, so it didn't quite make it over the 50% mark. Um, but I think it's, it's worth keeping it in mind as we listen to our stakeholders. We may find different things from researchers or different things from students or different things from people trying to make friends online. I don't know. <laughs> so, um, one, one advantage of it is finding out what's new. Yep. It's a way to really kind of keep up with changes. I reference from other from friends who are colleagues who are working in the same areas. So. That's right. Yeah, a 
assuming your friends are on the breaking edge instead of the like long tail. <laughs> Go for it. So one, there's no use in archiving it if people can't find it. Just throw that out there. Access is everything. Um, mm -hmm. The other part is, while I myself don't necessarily think this is like useful in my day to day or might be the most important, um, it's something I've heard from like almost every researcher I've talked to. Basically, like I want to work with other people at NYU on X, Y, Z. But I don't know people in that department, or I'd like to just get a profile of what people are doing. So I actually think, um, you know, I think it's very useful for researchers, more so maybe than for us. Do you think there's a, a way or a chance that when people ask that question, that the thing they want to find is people, not data? It's that we need people. to help people find people? It's always people. Yeah. Find it through their data. It always sounds like you're talking about the interest based on what my interests are, who do I want to be friends right. with? Profile. Yeah, or here's the stuff I've deposited. Who should I meet next? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Um, now um, let's look at de-identification. How useful would it be within PressQT or within your own systems and users you serve to have better tools to make it easier to de-identify or anonymize data so you can share it? Okay. Yes. I mean, that's really important um, and I know researchers don't understand how to do it if they understand that they have to do it but I think that's really institution by institution or even IRB mm -hmm. IRB type um, detail mm -hmm. where um, de-identification means something different to what you said in your IRB so I'm not sure um, it, it would be good to have like some best overall practices at this top level but then each individual project or researcher are going to have to figure out what that means for them. Yeah. Margaret, I think okay. you had a question and then we'll go for you, Steve. Right. Um, one thing, I mean, I don't really know exactly how that works, but one thing would be, I mean, someone does need to be held accountable for the data that's produced. And so, I mean, I don't know how the, if you're having anonymous data, I don't know how that works exactly. But I mean, like one thing to remember that's important is that like, there needs to be a citable source for, I mean, like if you're publishing something and you want to use data, you need a, a citable source as to where you got that data, who produced it, and when. Um, so I don't know if that is related to that. <laughs> yeah, I think it's tangential to it, but important. Steve, I think you wanted to add something. I want to talk about um, de identification because, I mean, I've got a bit of experience with clinical trials mm -hmm. and registries. Um, their requirements are far outside, I think, anything we could ever provide through this. Um, and the reason for that is, uh, gosh, there's so much, <laughs> so much process around it already, and it needs to be core to their business, you know, in a way, and needs to be designed from the ground up uh, at the start. Um, unless we're going to start making calls about how to do HIPAA compliance and stuff like that, and uh, whatever, or depending on the country, you know, straight up. Um, then I think we best get out of the business of <laughs> de-identification, um, at least on the, the clinical level. Yeah. It's not our game. Yeah, I think that's important to recognize. It might not be our game in preservation and curation um, because that data surfaces first to its review committees and its trial committees. The, the NIH, um, so, so the clinical trial I'm, I was actually involved with mainly was an NIH funded one, so mm -hmm. we're subject to their rules anyway, despite being in Australia. And, and um, their requirements on stratification of data and de-identification of data are so stringent and specific and checked that, you know, you'll do it anyway, regardless of that tool. <laughs> yeah. That's good to know. Um, now we're going to um, have a quick <coughs> review and I invite the panelists to swivel or do your yoga so that you can see what a survey respondents said about if they had a data or software preservation quality tool need, this project could help them develop. Um, one of them was related to a tool that would help transition data from active use by the researcher to curation status by the library. Um, we saw that a little bit in my Hildreth's cartoon yesterday with the researcher on one cliff and the curators on the other speaking different languages. Um, another one was who is going to pay for preservation of what and for how long. So um, uh, tools that acknowledge um, that when funding runs out, there have to be solutions in place for those 
whose uh, soft money expires, um, tools to help understand the state of data preservation, um, and a tool to help assign identifiers to emulated environments, a tool to identify which software environment content could be executed using, and tools or widgets that help make commercial products inter more interoperable. Um, for example, federated searching across Box, Dropbox, Google Drive, and so on. So um, I don't expect panelists to um, advocate for any one of these, but should you want to, feel free to jump on the bandwagon, or if you have others you would like us to add to the list, now's your chance to do so, or just to comment on the list and how um, groups like this can strategize getting community input about um, preservation quality tool needs this project can address. I'll give you a minute to think about it and then we'll, we'll run down the panel. Paul Leading, can you say whether or not OSF is a preservation tool or if you would consider it? That's a good question. Um, open Science Framework um, in and of itself has a mission to help support um, research through the entire scientific life cycle um, from idea generation and uh, establishment or registration of your hypotheses all the way to the conclusion of a project, um, data uh, sharing, analysis, and discovery. Um, they do that through a combination of services, not just the open science framework itself, where a lot of active data management during research takes place, but also in um, a tool and services they offer called registries. Registries do have a preservation mandate and a discovery uh, facility. They both help people find things, but they help them find the registered instance of it, which is definitely something that we often associate with preservation. That being said, uh, Open Science Framework and the Center for Open Science itself are um, grant-funded uh, nonprofit social benefit organizations. They do have a, um, a preservation trust fund so that nobody's data placed there, that money is invested to provide storage and access to your data should uh, Open Science Framework or Center for Open Science ever cease to exist as an organization and they have a transition plan. Um, but I think it's good for us in the context of grants like IMLS um, and their full audience of grantees but also organizations like Notre Dame and others who we do have an institutional responsibility to the researchers who work here at University of Notre Dame um, to help preserve their work as the knowledge that is uh, generated by our educational endeavor. So I think there are many stakeholders and in where organizations like Notre Dame and its institutional repository that does have a clear preservation mandate intersect with tools like OSF is really important space right now where a lot of, of movement happens, not only of data, <laughs> but of how people access that data, store it on what systems and that kind of thing. So I think those are really good questions. Ruth, did you want to add? Yeah, and you started going there and that is past preservation on curation and making the data useful to other users is way beyond, you know, just storing what they you know, user was providing during the research year. You might have to do a lot of work beyond that to make it useful. Um, so I would call that curation. Maybe we need tools for curation as well as preservation. Right. Perhaps not in the context of the preservation grant, but in the context of communicating with our stakeholders. Helen, would you like to comment? Yeah, I have two quite specific things in terms of uh, tools, you know. Uh, I, I think my concerns about uh, browser plugins, and I'm thinking about the data, you know, archived, which was published on the web. I think it could be a lot of things. It's how you, when you replay these historical web data in a newer or later version of the browser, how you deal with that problem. I think, you know, I'm thinking about two approaches broadly. One is almost like a library as a service on the web which contains emulated historical browsers you know when you need to render and replay 
a historical web page, you call that service, you know, or even you go there, fit in the your archival URL, what have you, you, you get the gist of it. Another is something I picked up, you know, this workshop. I think some of the techniques like containerization, containerization, you actually package up the browser environment plus or including the plugins that need it at the time of capture. Some of that information I know is actually, it is, it is captured. You have that information in the current crawling process. We don't necessarily keep it and we don't necessarily keep it in such a useful way that we can reuse it. So that's my sort of, I think that might be a useful tool to think okay. about. Great, I can edit it to our list. Sherry, would you comment yeah, on that? Yeah, I'll comment on the, I guess the last one about tools to help commercial projects. I'm thinking about the older versions of Excel or the older versions of um, Microsoft products. How are we going to use some of the older <coughs> files unless they get migrated as part of preservation on an ongoing basis to be able to be used in the latest version? Or do we keep some sort of copy of Microsoft Office 95? Um, to actually read my files. There is a web service which actually does that. It's the University of Freiburg. They have done research in that for quite a few years and now they actually have a web service. You, yeah. you can actually choose which one, you know, what version you have and then, yeah. So format migration services and services that help you identify, format, and replay are quite useful. Right, right. And also, I mean, it's not just your Microsoft, it's that your MATLABs right. and your sure. SPSSs and all, all, all of those that go there. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, um, we're planning to try and do that. We started to build a uh, just to go back and uh, recover as many of the pieces of software as we can and store them on uh, emulatable computer hard drive images. And, in the future, we would love to be able to offer that decision for us. So yeah. Cool. Yeah. We may get a mix of There we went to say that it's important for PressQT to um, incentivize uh, emulation services like the one that your organization is already committed to exploring and prototyping and um, look at ways that what we make interoperates, but also um, doesn't reinvent the wheel or be ignorant of the fact that the wheel's starting to exist. Anyone else want to add to that one? Um, yeah, I, I, if, it were, if I was involved in this thing more and, and there was an next workshop, I would actually step back a, a bit and, and take these examples and, and put them in a bucket together and and try and find an ideal of, of what well-preserved software, what are the characteristics of, of well-preserved software? What are some good examples? Um, where are their blind spots? Uh, you know, what's the baseline maybe of good? So just basically, uh, you know, map out that landscape with a couple of cases so we're all on the same page and, and, and move from there. It's only then once you understand, once people are generally agreed on what well-preserved software looks like that we can really have progress on, on what to do about it um you know things like what's going on at yale i mean that's part of sort of just analyzing the landscape what you'll probably find is that a lot of the stuff we're looking for is is not just done in a corner somewhere but right. like is is a prime focus of somebody's research like the people over in freiburg or yale um and and you know it's more about working with them and including them um in in this process but i don't I mean, I haven't looked really, but I don't think there is a framework out there that kind of explains in clear terms, and maybe even layman term, what, what well-preserved software looks like. And that would be a nice output. Great, okay. And I'm going to ask Vicky to participate in that interest group <laughs> to define what well-preserved software is and to provide some use cases. Because I think what RepoZip does is um, producing use cases of that type that we can use as examples, um, but also the way people curate uh, represent yeah. objects. I have a feeling librarians would say that's part of the step and yeah. there's all this other stuff. So that's why we need Yeah, everyone. I think so too. Yeah. But that's where a company like Microsoft could maybe have some interesting information. They can say we have an archive, all you have to do is call us up and we'll translate the file for you. <laughs> That's absolutely true. There are some cases where commercial entities have provided emulated right. environments that they will give yeah. for this version. Here's a right. environment that 
will work with data from that era. So when we make I mean, things, that's not unheard of. Right. So when we make things more findable, perhaps one of the things we have to make findable are emulators. Or even the, the technical spec of some mm -hmm. file formats. I mean, you mean if you don't have the emulator, if you have that sort of detailed information, you can write an emulator more easily. <laughs> Great. So we're nearing the end. Um, we're at 2.53. We've got about five minutes left. We have one more question. Is there a tool gap in your current digital ecosystem or workflow? If so, please describe. You don't have to read the ones people have already contributed about. Tell us about your own um, or if there's one you've heard about in this workshop that you'd, you'd like us to remember. I'll give you a moment to think about that one. Often your gap is something that you've hired someone to do and your gap's being covered by human labor right now, or it's the thing that you have a workaround for, <laughs> or it's the audience you can't or don't serve who when they come you say, sorry, we don't do that, or sorry, we don't do that yet. Yeah, so we, um, the group I was in um, published a, a paper and alongside it, was invited to publish the tool about that in Nature Protocol. Um, and the people working on it, the scientists, I was just acknowledged on the thing, I wasn't part of the science. Um, you know, they're not, they didn't have any idea how to, to do that, to, to get that tool out in a, in a portable, reproducible kind of way, um, let alone a hosted way where people can actually just spit out deploying it themselves going. So it kind of felt to me as the, the dude who knew that kind of stuff in the group. Um, and it was a significant undertaking and it took a lot of stuff. Now, if something like Reprisive sort of was around, um, you know, or something like that, I could have actually maybe put it in their hands and gone, well, actually you, you run this, create the Docker container and that's step one. And I, you know, I'll figure out some of the hosting stuff and some of the other stuff around that, um, but maybe not even. So there are, there are real, there are real sort of tools that can be produced um, or, you know, it's maybe if it's just awareness yeah. <laughs> um, is half the, half the battle, right? right. Um, yeah, I, uh, yeah, because it, it was, like I said, it was like two weeks of my time or something full time to, to really get it in the shape that, that, that nature would with it. Sure. It's hard work. Yes. Any others that want to hop on that question? If not, I'll move to our final question. Just, I mean, tool gaps, I, I, there's um, a mailing list I subscribe to. There's lots of data like that's trapped in PDFs. So, I mean, so there's lots of tools that, um, yeah. that, that might be useful to get the data out of PDFs yeah. and the Bible and the, the books of sense that you know, scan them in, you've got these evil images, but. Um, and, and, then, and there's a lot of citizen science going on, I think, like Zooniverse or whatever, that actually does have people you know, typing in what they see visually and actually adding to a database. But um, there's, those are people doing that. Yeah, I just wondered, I mean, surely there, there are a lot of gaps or lack of tools, but is there is there also the, the opposite that there are almost too many tools. I don't mean that. What, what I meant is that you don't necessarily know how to evaluate the tools in existence. It would be great if you can clear, if I know what I want to achieve, my purpose, my research purpose is that the project can come up with ways to help me quickly and easily identify and select a tool that fits my purpose. So that's it. Yeah. I think one of the things we said earlier, once we can define what a sunny day scenario for achieving our purpose is, mm -hmm. it will help us make those tool choices. Because okay. yeah, the thing but is, the tools will change all the time as well. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's hard to but publish a best case. Uh, yeah. okay. One of the things I noticed from the last couple of slides is we're concerned with how to curate it so it's useful for future searches that we can spend all day analyzing what they might possibly be. But this also kind of links back to that in, in the sense that almost all of these are about making sure to preserve the provenance back to the original. But I was thinking about that when you said that. What says a bitmap or a JPEG is a better format than locked into the PDF? You know, just because we feel now that we can pull out and augment with curation and metadata that image from this particular page of a PDF, we still want to track that it came from that PDF and the PDF was the original source potentially, because one might not be as useful as the other, depending on the purpose of future use of our curated indexing. Great. Um, well, that's a good observation. 
Um, final question. How should Press QT engage with you going forward? So Sandra showed you yesterday our timeline. You can see it on the pressqt.crc.nd.edu <coughs> website. Bring that timeline up, think about it. We are in the beginning phase of our stakeholder engagement. We have another workshop planned for fall. We have a work period in between. Um, during those months that are bookended by the workshops, how can we best engage with you? Um, I invite uh, comments from the audience. One of our questions in our survey is, can we contact you and keep you informed? Um, thankfully, everyone who participated so far said yes. Um, I'm going to invite each of our panelists to comment on how we can best engage with you going forward. And I'm thrilled that we have a variety of panelists um, to answer this question because it's important that we take into consideration all our stakeholders' needs, not just those whose job it is to do data and software preservation or curation. And um, I'm going to start with Margaret. Um, yeah, so I think that one thing that'd be great to see is just engagement, especially with the undergraduate community and people who are going into this field so that they're aware that these are issues that need to be addressed. Um, and out of personal experience, this isn't something that's really ever talked about at the undergraduate level as far as research goes. And so really making it a point to, you know, engage with, you know, the, the next generation, I think. Huh? I'm thinking how, you know, I, I would like to work with you to think of a way to actually engage with the Office of Information Technologies on campus, because actually they uh, serve as and maintain a large number of the patients which holds our data currently. Uh, whether there is a way, even if it's, you know, just awareness raising, so if there are ways to sort of engage with that part of campus, because these people in general are fairly clued up. I think they're taught to coding, which mm -hmm. should be fairly easy <laughs> to understand some of the details, but I think it's the it's awareness of why we're doing this, why it is important. Right. And um, Steve, yeah. would you like to comment on that? Because you've kind of been on yeah. both sides of that fence more than once. Yeah, right? I'll say that um, it's not their first priority, um, which is why precisely why you need to talk to the people involved because for these, for people running and live storage and archiving things or just running storage for the masses, right? Um, first and foremost is running that as a service that will work and that will expand yeah. to the needs of the people. Um, they often, in that mission, at least in my experience, that people lose sight of, well, what's actually in there and how is it structured and how could you ever reduce it or account for it or report back on it? Uh, and this is actually a role this, this project here could play. That you could say, well, actually, we want to help you sort out that mess and have a, a structure in which to, to tally up that stuff. And I'll actually thank you for that as they're trying to provide profiles to, to themselves, to their, their DVCRs or their provosts or whatever. Um, they, they do want to know, they just, it's just not what they give towards. Yeah. And then also to, to extend the attention span almost like, you know, to, to extend the focus beyond just now. Yes. To think a little it's a, bit about- It's a service provisioning, it's yeah. a service operations culture. Um, Sure, do you like to comment? Yeah, um, I just think about how should PressQ engage with us? I think um, you, you mentioned about sending out um, the survey to a group of users or whatever, and I, I, I would like to see UVA participate in that, Great. see how far we can get out. And if there are any talking points so that if we do send people out on uh -huh. what talk, you know, mm -hmm. to talk about this, what questions specifically that, you know, maybe 10, quest 10 quick questions that we could ask people or to get you know, some quick feedback on one-on-one -on -one type of things. That's great feedback, thanks. How about from um, those of you who have um, patiently waited through the entire two days of the Press QT workshop, thank you so much. Um, this is your um, chance to tell us how to stay in touch with you going forward and um, to make sure that um, the communication you receive from us and the ways you can participate actually benefit you. Um, please um, feel free to email the PresQT team, presqt-contact-list at nd.edu. 
that goes to myself, Sandra, Rick, and John. I want to thank IMLS, um, my team members, John, Sandra, and um, Rick, and uh, all our panelists, but especially you who have participated these whole two days. Thanks for everything, your lightning talks, your breakouts, the opportunities to learn about new technology. Um, we do want to stay in touch and uh, thanks for your participation in PresQT. If you need assistance with travel or receipts, please let me know. And uh, thanks to everyone. You'll get a notice about workshop two.